So now that we've seen the exponential function, y equals b to the x, we can see that it's definitely one-to-one -one because it passes that horizontal line test. So we know it has an inverse. But what operation will be able to bring this power down and be able to solve for y if we swap those? So that's going to be where this logarithmic function comes into play. So the inverse of y equals b to the x is a logarithmic function, y equals log base b of x. So b is the base, it's going to be the same base in the exponential as it is for its inverse in the log. So for this function, with x being greater than 0, b being greater than 0, and ignoring that case when the base is 1, the logarithmic function with base b is denoted by f of x equals log base b of x where specifically you have y equals log base b of x, if and only if you can write it as an equivalent exponential. So it's got to be b to the y equals x. One way you can remember this is with a phrase bacon and eggs. So you've got this log base b of x equaling y, and this tells us is equivalent to the exponential equation b to the y equals x. So those switch each other. Bacon and eggs refers to the fact that the B is the base, the A is the answer, and the exponent is our eggs. So you can read this as bacon and eggs, or you can remember it by bay. Same thing. Use the initials. So let's go ahead and rewrite these two expressions in equivalent exponential form. So I've got log base 2 of 32 equals 5. So this 2 is our base, our answer, our exponent. So this is equivalent. The base is... So this is equivalent to the base, which is 2. The answer is 32. And the exponent is 5. So that is our equivalent exponential form. If we do the same thing in part B, log base 1 fourth of 64 is negative 3. Our base is 1 fourth. Our answer is 64. And our exponent is negative 3. So you can see these are equivalent expressions. And this helps us with evaluating logarithmic functions. So let's try to rewrite now in equivalent logarithmic form given the exponential. So we've got 3 to the 4th equals 81. So if I pick off the pieces, the 3 is the base, the 4 is the exponent, and the 81 is the answer. So this is the same thing as log base 3. I got my base, my answer, my exponent. So log base 3 of 81 is equal to 4. If we look at this next one, we've got the square root of 169 equals 13. And I don't really have an exponent yet, but remember square roots you can write as one half powers. So this is equivalent our, to our log. The base is 169. The answer is 13 and the exponent is one half. So that is our equivalent logarithmic expression. So let's utilize the fact that each of these logarithmic equations corresponds to an exponential equation to try to solve for our missing variable. So we want to solve what is the value of x so that log base 5 of 1 equals x. So I'm going to rewrite this in exponential form. So I've got my base, my answer, my exponent. So my base is 5, my answer is 1, and my exponent is x. The only way 5 to the x can equal 1 is if x equals 0. So that is our solution to this equation. If we look at the next one, we've got log base 4 of x is 5 halves. So I'm going to again rewrite this in exponential form. So our base is 4, our answer is x, and our exponent is 5 halves. So all I need to do is evaluate this to find what x is going to be. So x is going to be 4 to the 1 half to the 5th power. So that's going to be 2 to the 5th, which is 32. So the missing value of x is 32. Okay. 
Now to get the graph, we can utilize the fact that we know everything about the exponential function to graph that logarithmic. So based on the value of our base, we've got these two different exponential functions which I have already graphed. So here's b to the x when the base is bigger than 1, and here's b to the x when the base is between 0 and 1. Each of these exponential functions goes through the point 0, 1. Because of that, the reflections are about the line y equals x. This point, 0, 1, is going to correspond to 1, 0 on each of the graphs, regardless of what that base is going to be. Now my actual logarithmic function will look like this when it's reflected. And likewise here, if we reflect this about y equals x, we get this as our logarithmic function. So here is y equals log base b of x in the case your base is bigger than 1, and here is the case when the base is between 0 and 1. Now, because they're also inverses, we can find the properties and important things by swapping those roles of x and y. So let's look at the exponential function and let's look at the logarithmic function. For the exponential function, we know the domain is all real numbers and the range is from 0 to infinity. Because those roles switch, the range becomes the domain of the inverse and the domain is the range of the inverse. So for the logarithmic function, our domain is from 0 to infinity, while our range is all real numbers. For the exponential function, we don't have an x-intercept, and the y-intercept is 0, 1. So we're going to go ahead and swap those kind of roles here. So now I no longer have a y-intercept, and my x-intercept will flip that point because x and y switch. So my x-intercept will be the point 1, 0. For our horizontal asymptote, y equals 0 is the horizontal for the exponential, and there's no vertical. Again, these roles switch. So now I have no horizontal asymptote, but my vertical asymptote becomes the line x equals 0. So x and y switch. So the one thing you really want to notice here is the domain of that logarithmic function is 0 to infinity. So we cannot take the logarithm of 0 or a negative number. What's inside the argument has to be greater than 0 for our log function. But the range is all real numbers. So let's look at an example. We're going to work with this logarithmic function, and we want to state the domain and range. So for our domain, we need what's inside to be greater than 0. So we need that argument 7 minus x to be greater than 0. So that tells us 7 is greater than x. So our domain is from negative infinity up to 7. Our range, if you shift this any what way, up, down, left, right, not going to make a difference on the range being all real numbers. So our range is still negative infinity to infinity. So you always need what's inside the logarithm to be greater than 0 for the domain. That's going to be one key thing we have to have. Okay. So now let's get some practice with graphing. Let's graph this function f of x equals log base 2 of negative x plus 2. So we want to pick out what some transformations are. So the first thing is I have this minus sign on the inside. That's going to tell me I have to reflect about the y-axis. And then I've got this plus 2 on the outside. That's going to be that vertical shift, so we're going to shift up 2. And then I'm also going to look at my domain and range just to kind of help us out with graphing. So for my domain, I need the inside to be greater than 0. So that's negative x is greater than 0, or x is less than 0. So my end graph should really be on the left side of my Cartesian plane. And my range still doesn't matter. These transformations don't affect all real numbers. So let's go ahead and apply these two transformations. I'm going to start with the graph of our typical logarithmic function. So log base 2 of x will go through this point 
one zero and it'll have our standard shape. So this is y equals log base two of x. Now I've got that minus sign that's going on in the inside. So I'm gonna reflect about the y axis and that's gonna land me at the point zero, negative one. And so here would be our reflection and this is the graph of y equals log base two of negative x. So that's my first transformation. The second transformation, I wanna go ahead and shift this up to. So I've gotta start by graphing this function again. So here is log base two of negative x. And then I just wanna shift it up to. So the point that's at negative one zero will get shifted up to, to negative one two. But the graph will still hold that same shape. So here's y equals log base two of negative x plus two, okay? Now, just like we have a bunch of properties for exponentials, we have similar properties that end up being translated over for logarithms. So all of these can be shown just from those exponential properties. So to kind of set the tone, just to make sure we're not taking logs of negative values, we're gonna let x, y, and b be great numbers greater than zero. b is not gonna be our boring case, which is our base, so b can equal one. And then r can be anything at once. As long as that's true, the following properties hold. So the first one is if you take log base b of one, it's going to equal zero. And that's because if you rewrite this in equivalent exponential form, here's our base, our answer, our exponent. So b to the zero equals one. So regardless of the base, log base b of one will always end up equaling zero. Likewise, if you take log base b of b, you're always gonna get one because in equivalent exponential form, the base is b, the answer is one, and then the exponent, the base is b, the answer is b, and the exponent is one. So in equivalent, exp or in equivalent exponential form, you get b to the first is b, which is true. Third property, if you take log base b of b to the r, remember the logarithmic function and the exponential function are inverses of each other, so you're just going to get r in return. And if you do the reverse, if you take b and evaluate it at its equivalent logarithmic function, it's going to undo each other and you're going to get x. So both of these hold because b to the x and log base b of x are inverses of each other. The last couple properties also stem from our properties of exponentials. If I have the product of two numbers inside my logarithm, I can split that as addition. If we have division of two numbers, it gets split as subtraction. If you have log base b of x to a power, that power can pop out front and you get log base b of x times r on the outside. So these properties are great because they allow us to be able to manipulate expressions, um, condense, combine them, and in return we can solve a lot of equations. So let's go ahead and just simplify all these different pieces. We want to evaluate log base 5 of 1, and again, if you aren't 100% sure of the property, put it in that exponential form. But this is going to equal 0, because five to the zero equals one. I've got log of 2.5 to the same base, so those really undo each other. You just get one in return. So it's the same thing as 2.5 to the first power is still 2.5. If we look at log base five of five to the 10th power, those two cancel each other out and you just get 10. We've got eight to the log base eight of three. Those are inverses, so they cancel out. You just get three in return. 
Now in this last one, we've got a lot more work to do. So it's really kind of natural. You see two to the log base two, you want them to cancel, but you can't do that immediately because there's a constant in front of that logarithm. So instead what we have to do is use our properties to get two to the log base two. So rewriting it, removing that negative two. I'm filming. I'm filming. Poop, I'm in the middle of filming. So one of our properties tells us you can take exponents inside logarithms and pop it out. So we can do the same thing here but bring this negative two on the inside as an exponent. So I'm really kind of reversing this rule. This would normally pop out front. Now I'm undoing that process. But now I've got two to the log base two. So now I can say these cancel each other out because they're inverses. So we're left with negative 18, and then we're left with the inside, which is three X to the negative two. So now we just need to simplify. You've got a negative exponent, pops down in the bottom to make it positive. If you distribute that square, you get negative 18 over nine x squared. And then 18 over nine simplifies to two. So this whole thing just simplifies to negative two over x squared. So the last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna use just properties of logs to rewrite stuff because very soon we're gonna talk about solving logarithmic equations and being able to manipulate using the properties is gonna be an important tool. So let's start with log base four of the square root of x times the cube root of x. So because we have multiplication in here, our property tells us we can split this as addition. So I get the logarithm of the first piece plus the logarithm of the second piece. And now I can take it a step further because the square root of x is the same thing as x to the one half. Cube root of y is the same thing as y to the one third. So each of these exponents will just pop right out front using our other properties of logs. So this is equivalent to one half log base four of x plus one third log base four of y. Now in this next one, we're gonna do the same thing. You ultimately might get something slightly different, but they will be the same. So there's a couple different routes you can kind of take for this. We've got a lot going on. One thing you could do is distribute this seven to all of the pieces, but also what you can do is just use your properties to bring the seven right out front. So that's the route I'm gonna take, but if you do a different approach, that's perfectly fine too. So I can pop that seven out front and I'm left with everything on the inside. Now, I've got this numerator, which is being completely divided by the x squared minus five. So I'm gonna keep the seven out front and I'm gonna work with this remaining logarithm. So I get log of the numerator and it's being divided by x squared minus five, so we just subtract that. And then finally, I've got the product of two things. My property tells me I can split those as addition. So you get seven log of the first piece plus log of the second piece, and then this whole thing is still being subtracted by the log of x squared minus five. And then the very last thing I can do is I still have an exponent in here, so let's go ahead and pop that out front and you get two times log base eight of three X minus one. So this would be as far as I could possibly expand it. You could distribute the seven to get seven of the first log, 14 minus seven of each of those, but it's not necessary. Okay. 
So the last thing we're gonna do is we're going to condense a logarithm. So I've got this thing as spread out as I possibly can, and I wanna use my properties to condense it to a single log. So the first thing I can do, I can't start combining anything until I've got log of the same base of something. So I need to go ahead and get rid of all of these exponents that I have out front to just get the logarithms on their own. So these will come right back inside as exponents. So the first one gives you log base three of x squared plus four to the one fourth. And then you get minus log base three of x squared minus three to the one half. And then I don't need to do anything with this other logarithm. Now I've got one log minus the same. So they have to have that same base. So I can condense that as division. And then I wanna go ahead and subtract this other logarithm. So you can also rewrote those exponents with radicals if you choose, but you don't need to. So 1 fourth power is the fourth root, 1 half power is square root. So I'm taking this first expression and I'm subtracting log base three of x minus one. That's the same thing as taking this expression then and dividing it by x minus one. But if you take a fraction, divide it by something, it's just gonna get put in the denominator. So really at the beginning, you can kind of see the pieces that are negative both end up in the denominator. So you don't have to take it step by step if you're comfortable recognizing that those pieces go in the bottom. Anything that's positive is going to stay in that numerator, but you can only combine if they have the same base.